of you this morning know that just praise can turn, can turn your whole attitude around. Praise can change your, the way you look at circumstances. Praise can work miracles. Hallelujah. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God. 
For those of you who know that we've been praying for a young lady over in Eastern Carolina that needed a heart transplant. They found a donor this week and they started the surgery yesterday expecting it to take 12 hours. And five and a half hours later they were finished. Her heart's doing good. She's doing good. We serve a prayer answering God. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I just have a couple of announcements. Um, May the 28th, of course, is our <clears throat> annual anniversary, which is going to be followed immediately by a cookout. There's a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center, and we're going to make that'll be something to look forward to, of course. Wednesday night Bible service is at 6 p.m. and 6.30, sorry. And I, um, Kevin, I think, has a few announcements if he wants to come on up. Um, before I introduce Mindy to give our missions spotlight for, for this month, I want to point out that there's a reason we shout out our praise. Yeah. We best, have you noticed the defeated enemy seems to be working a little bit of overtime right now, yeah. right? Yeah. But he sees that God is moving in our midst, in our body, and he's trying his best to cause dissension, to cause disunity, to cause frustration and despair. But I want you to know there's reason to give praise. Yes, there, is. there are people in this service right now yeah. that are giving praise to God Thank you, Jesus. in spite yeah. of the worst journey of their lives. Some of you don't know Brother Leon. But his journey is nearly finished. And yet, his beautiful wife is praising God because his finished journey is nearly complete. He's almost home. We have a different way of looking at life and at death. And because of that, we have victory and freedom in so many ways. We got to reach out and grab that. And look at what God is doing, not what this world is doing, right? Remember to keep your focus where it belongs on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, right? Sorry, I didn't mean to go on. Anyway, so, praise God. Judy, can you give a short testimony? My husband, Leon, 
has been sick for almost seven years now with a terrible disease. It is a neurological disease called PSP, which stands for Progressive Supranuclear Palsy. Progressive being the key word. When we were told that this was his diagnosis, we were told there was no cure and no treatment. He was a high school teacher, a coach, athletic, one of the smartest people I've ever known, and our children and their families and I have watched him diminish over the past seven years. But the one thing that I have held on to with every step and every day, I start the day knowing that God's grace will be sufficient for that day. And he has been faithful every single day. And he will continue to be faithful until he goes home. Um, I took care of, we went from being able to be normal to a walker to a wheelchair to bedridden and five I took care of him five months at home by myself and then he is now in a facility but they have been extremely good to him and I feel really good about where he is and what's going on um, interesting Kevin asked me this because on my way to church I heard a statement that just kind of it, it was in the regard that Billy Graham has been gone for some time now, but his words will live on as long as this earth is here. And the words that were spoken was, God's will will not take us where his grace you, won't Jesus. sustain Thank us. You. That's the nutshell. God's grace. It's free and it's amazing. So now our mission spotlight this month, Mindy's going to give it on Kenya. And I wanted to introduce this because I wanted to brag on Mindy. She was an original member of our missions team. And she has always had a heart for people. Beginning in her home and extending around the world. That love for people is a necessity in the kingdom of God. Yes, and she's a brilliant example of that love. Yes. And so I wanted to thank her for her willingness to step out and to love regardless. So come give your mission spotlight, and if you'll talk about the bowling after that. All right. So Kevin's been giving the missions spotlights, but uh, I'm going to do it this time because I've been uh, I've been working on um, this project for a couple years, and it's it's just been a progressive a progressive thing. Um, so we have people on the ground in Kenya. Go ahead and put the first first slide up. Thank you. We have the, the map here, it's for you guys, it's kind of small, but we have people on the ground in, um, in the Mombasa area, and now recently, um, Brother Mark has partnered with Paraclesis Ministries with a, a pastor there on, in the southwest um, area of, of Kenya. So Mombasa is kind of southeast, it's actually on the ocean. And so uh, I'm not sure the, the city or the town area where, um, well, we can't read it anyway. It's too small. So somewhere on the, <laughs> on the, uh, in the southwest region of the map there. Um, and he's been working with a pastor, 
Paul Oyagi, and um, we have some needs in both areas. So Pastor Paul Oyagi is the pastor that uh, we raised some money for, for some Bibles to provide for them, and um, not just in his church, but immediate, in, in that immediate need, but also for the surrounding area when they go out and minister to villages and stuff so that they have Bibles to give to the people um, when they send supplies and they can minister and share the word with them and literally share the word with them, actually give that to them. So that was a, a great thing. Thank you for your support in that. Um, now, thank you. It's like you have my notes. <laughs> <laughs> and so then in the southeast, uh, so when I need a next slide, I'll probably just say next slide or something or look at you. You're good. You're good. Um, so then in the southeast area of in near Mombasa, we have um, the ministry of, um, and he has like a team. It's not just his ministry. It's Brother Patrick Gitonga, and this is who is pictured in the middle of, the, of these group of kids. Uh, he is actually a trusted friend of George Bates, um, and he's assisted with the missions trips that Brother Douglas and Kevin and Mark have taken to Kenya. Um, and so he's who I've been talking to for the last couple of years, finding out what their needs are, how, what, how can we help, and getting information and stuff. So next slide, please. So Patrick and his team ministered to um, some rural, vill rural <laughs> villages in southwest, uh, to the southwest of Mombasa. Um, and every few months they go and treat the people and, their, and the homes for jiggers. It's kind of like our chiggers, the mites that can make your skin itchy, maybe even live under your skin a little bit. Um, they, they're, they're, they're really pesky. Um, so in these pictures, um, they are using a peroxide solution to treat these children for the jiggers. Um, they treat the adults too. These pictures just happen to be for kids. Um, and if you'll put the next slide up. More kids getting treated. And the next one. So this is a photo of a newly constructed home. And you can see the walls are made of mud and the floor is dirt. So they will go to each home and spray the floors and probably the lower parts of the walls um, to help keep those pests at bay. They can't completely eradicate them. They live in the dirt, so they're just trying to help keep it under control. So the next slide, please. And another ministry that they, that they assist with is they'll go and deliver supplies, food, clothing um, to the villages. And while they do these um, on these missions trips, um, they do share the word. They don't just go and, and hand out food and clothing. They will share the word there, too. They'll gather around a tree and have little church services and stuff. So it's good to know that the truth is being shared to them while they supply some needs for these people. But the biggest need that the people have is the need for water. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Imagine not having this beautiful, clean water. Next slide. We definitely take it for granted. We can go to almost any faucet, turn it on, and have clean water at our fingertips. Uh, except for Asheville and some other areas sometimes when they have a deep freeze and the city pipes freeze and then the city doesn't have water. I live in Hendersonville. I was so blessed not to be part of that. <laughs> but I heard, I, and on the news, you've seen stories of people having to go to the store. Um, they would get gallons of water or, you know, however they were dispersing it. Um, and bottle, you know, the, the drinking water, the big bottles of water so that they can cook and maybe bathe with a little bit. <laughs> But those of you who went through that, you know what, how troublesome it was. And that was just a few days. Um, next slide, please. But imagine if that's what you got when you went into town to go get water for your family to cook with and drink and bathe in. So many of you know that I've been uh, working on a project to provide a well. Some of you, this is your first time learning about it. That's why we're doing the mission spotlight on Kenya. Um, if you could do the next slide, please. 
So these next few slides, what the uh, gathering information was doing things like gathering these pictures and stuff of a well that had been provided um, within the last year or two to an area that provides for them. Now those are big jugs. And if you look at the rest of the picture, so we'll go to the next slide. There's no vehicles to transport these jugs. It's, it's manpower, baby power, kid power, woman power. Um, maybe not baby power. <laughs> Strap to their back and they crawl down on the woods. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But as you can imagine, that's, that's a lot of work to go and, and fill that up um, and carrying it back to wherever you live. Um, next, oh, the, the, go back, I'm sorry. The black thing there is, th so the well is pumping water to that, and it's a reservoir for them. So then over where you see the people gathered, I'm pointing back there, you guys don't see it. Um, the, where you see the people gathered, there's a spigot that comes up from the, from the ground that's going from that reservoir so that they have a supply of water. They don't need to wait for the to pump to bring it up and stuff. Uh, go ahead with the next one. Okay, so these wells in a, in, in a desert land, um, not a lot of rain. It is, th this particular area has got some green, um, but there's not a lot of rain, so uh, the wells have to be kind of deep. And I even asked a professional plumber one day, I don't know who that is. <laughs> I said, Joe, if a well is 150 feet deep, does it need a pump? because we were hoping to you know, try and do a hand pump so it would be cheaper for the fundraiser and everything. And he said, oh, absolutely. So I was like, OK. <laughs> anyway, so what you see in the pictures here is them installing a, a pump. And then over here in the, on the right is a little building that they put up. So they got a little bit of shelter, maybe have picnics. I don't know what they do under there. But that houses the solar panels, keeps them up off the ground and protects them a little bit. Um, now, it's not going to protect them in a hailstorm, but hopefully that doesn't happen. You just have to trust the Lord to protect us. Um, but that's how they get the electricity because, again, they're in rural areas and don't have that for powering the pump. So the cost keeps going up. But the burden, it's not going to go away just because the cost goes up. Um, one thing that these pictures aren't showing you is the need of the elderly people. I've been in, the el in caring for elderly people, and now I'm working in the office of a company that cares for elderly people. I've been in their homes, and you can imagine caring for an elderly person. It's hard enough as it is with clean water. Um, imagine doing, having, that they just don't have any care. They don't have, they, a lot of times they don't have family or caregivers. They don't have nursing homes to care for them. Their beds are not off the, off the ground. They're sleeping on like wicker mats that are on the, on the dirt. Um, a lot of them have um, just many, many health problems. Um, it's just, it's really sad. I, didn't, I have a lot of pictures of elderly in their, in their homes on their mats and stuff, but um, I didn't share any of those. That wasn't my focus, but that is part of the need as well, that these people have not only food and supplies, but that they um, have clean water. So, I like this picture, it looks like a window looking out of the people gathering, getting water. All right, um, let's see what's the next slide. All right. So this has been, this, this, this uh, the Wells project has been on my heart for quite a long time. My original burden for Kenya was probably way back when Blake was a little toddler and we were at a youth conference and I just was over, overcome with this burden for Kenya and it just kind of hasn't left me so I'll probably be on a trip to Kenya within the next year or two. <laughs> um, so I've been getting the information, like I said, trying to find a way to get a well pla uh, in place for, for these sweet people. So for the last few months, I've been taking donations and putting them on Marketplace. There's a slide there, nothing that I'm selling there, but just a general um, screenshot of Marketplace. So. What I'm bringing to you today is that if you go through your closets or your garage or your shed and you find small things that you can bring to church and, don't, and you feel like you'd like to donate that to this cause, um, I'd love to take them. I'm putting them on Marketplace and I'm going, it's, it's more work than I thought it would be. But <laughs> especially with a full-time job telling people, well, I have to meet you after six or Saturday between two and four and 
So it's it's uh, but it's it's raised almost uh, two thousand dollars so far. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, these are just estimates. Um, it's, we're hoping to get at least that at eight thousand dollars. Hopefully, it costs actually costs a little less. And with the way that the dollar is moving in our economy right now, it might even cost a little bit more because it seems to be not ha it's not as valuable as it, it as it was. But we're just going to trust God. Uh, he owns the cattle of a thousand hills. And I have no reason to think that he doesn't love these people as much as he loves us. Um, we are just living in a blessed economy and, and, a, and a blessed country. And we have the rivers and the lakes and we have that clean water. But lots of areas in the world don't have that. Um, so we're just trusting God with that. We, we would love to, to get at least one well. Um, one well in this particular area that we're talking about will serve about five villages, and about, that'll be about 2,000 people that we can help get clean water for. And Brother Mark recently, just a couple weeks ago, told me about um, where, where Pastor Oyagi is, um, that their water is now contaminated. It was recently contaminated. And it was like, well, maybe they're close enough that we could, you know, kind of maybe meet in the middle or something. But you see that the map is there one over here and one way over there. Um, and it certainly wouldn't be fair to take a well from Brother Patrick, who we've been working with for a couple years trying to or organize all of this. But God is able. And I said to Paul or to Mark, uh, God can give us two wells. We don't know what he's going to do. He could just absolutely just pour out and give us two wells. Hey, let's claim four. Um, <laughs> God is crazy. We're crazy. And we just, we just know that God loves them and wants to provide for them. And he wants to get glory and victory for this ministry. Um, glory be to him. Uh, I've just been trying to be a vessel. And, um, and that's it. So... Before I turn this over to Pastor, or, or actually, I, I'm going to, after I'm done with this, I'm going to talk about our youth bully night. I didn't know it was going to happen that way, but it's okay. Be instant in season and out of season, the Bible says. Um, let me find my place. So before I do that, I want to invite you to help, okay? I've already mentioned the, the marketplace. Um, and if the Lord lays on your heart that you don't, you just don't want to go through the trouble of going through your closets, maybe you already did and you've already donated everything, I don't know. Um, we do take cash and check, credit card, MasterCard, blah, 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 blah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but most importantly, I want to invite you to pray. Pray about this project because the, your prayers are going to God who is able to move, go far above and beyond any of our expectations. I started out wanting two wells. A need was brought to my attention a couple weeks ago. We really could use two, or one well. We could really use two wells. And who knows? Thank you, Jesus. So um, I just, I want, I want to invite you to pray about this project. And I know we all have things going on in our lives. Um, a lot of us have family members who are going through physical and some mental issues, um, there's financial needs, there's needs at work. We have, we have things, but when you're praying, if you'll just slip a prayer in for Kenya, yep. God's going to hear them and he's going he's gonna to bless them. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see a great, well, we're going to see a great return on that investment of prayer. Yeah. I want to pray real quick. Lord, I thank you for the burden that you have placed in my heart. It doesn't, it's not always easy to have it but you've given it, and I just want to be obedient. I serve a, a giving God, a loving God, and I serve in a home here in Asheville with hearts for people that love people and want to bless people just as much as, as, the, as I do. So, Lord, I pray that you not only would move in me and be able to, to do the work that you've called me to do, but that you would just minister to those that are here to move in their hearts, Lord mighty God, because we want to be a blessing to not only the people in our cities, 
here in the United States, but we want to be a blessing to the people in Kenya and other places around the world. We want the children to have clean water to drink and to bathe in. We want the elderly people to have their needs taken care of because we know how hard it is just to care for them here in the United States with all of these, all of our resources. And we want to be a blessing to you, Lord mighty God. And we want you to get the glory for all that you were going to do, Lord Jesus. Move in such a way, Lord mighty God, that we cannot take the glory for it. Right. Move in such a way, Lord mighty God, that we can only say, whoo, I have no idea how that happened. But God... Thank you, Jesus, for your blessings upon us, and thank you, Lord, for your blessings upon the people that we are ministering to in Kenya through the people we have on the ground there, Lord. Let these bonds never be broken, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So real quick, I just want to continue with our announcements, and we are having a youth bowling night on May 19th, which is not this Friday, but the following Friday. We're going to have it over here at the AMF Star Lanes on Kenilworth, which is just down Tunnel Road and then up the road just real quick on Kenilworth. At 6 p.m., um, the church is blessing our youth and chaperones. Um, so bring money for food, and everything else uh, will be provided for, for you. Um, there is a sign-up list in the Welcome Center. Um, even if your whole family is going to be bowling, Use a line for each bowler, please. That's going to help me um, with the reservation. I need to know how many people are actually going, and that'll save me the time. If you do plan on bringing the kids and you're not going to be bowling, don't put your name on the list. You could be an observer, and I don't need to know about that. Nah, I don't need to know about that. But I do need to know who's actually going to be bowling so that we can have proper, re proper reservation and also an idea of, of uh, what the budget will be. All right, if that's it. Any more announcements? If we can have some ushers at this time. Brother Kevin, would you bless our tithes and all? Yo 
Y'all, sometimes when you look at pictures of other places, you remember how blessed you are for little things. I feel so blessed. Thank you, Jesus. I feel so blessed. God is so good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Put up that first verse, Bridget. I don't know what the first word is. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. We don't mean music is okay. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Oh, oh. King of Kings. Thank you, Lord. Right? Thank you, Jesus. at this time. For everyone who is remaining, I want you to just close your eyes for a moment and think about 
the Holy One that we were just praising, right? That King of Kings, that Lord of Lords. When you enter into the presence of the Lord, do you feel an awestruck wonder? Or is it just another moment, another day, another passing through? I watched a prominent clinical psychologist who was teaching at the University of Toronto. I watched him in a public forum cry like a child because someone asked him if he believed in God. And he began to weep because he said, if I say that I believe in God and I really believe, then it would have to change everything in my life. And I thought about how carelessly we live our lives as if we say we believe, but the way that we are living our lives does not say, I believe in an almighty God, and I am in awe of his presence and his wonder. In the name of Jesus, Lord, help us to be open to that awestruck wonder The understanding, Lord Jesus, that you have all power in heaven and in earth and under the earth, that all things were made by you and for you, and without you was not anything made that was made. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. There's something just wonderfully just wonderful about just acknowledging that God is God. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Woo! Praise the Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are in all of your presence. Thank you, Lord. In the Psalms, David wrote, let the words of my mouth, what I speak, and the meditation of my heart, what I think about, what I care about, be acceptable in your sight, O oh God. I can read this scripture and repent all day long. Because we have the power of life and of death in our tongue. And we as people of God should know and understand that. For we are the people who believe 
that God spoke into the darkness and created light. He spoke into nothing and created something. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We are created by an almighty God who spoke the worlds into existence. There is power in the word of God. There is power in the words that you speak. And we should know that there is power in the words that we speak. But instead of acknowledging and realizing what that power is, we just toss words out there. That person's an idiot. That's a moron. I'm sick. They're sick. Everything's broke. Everybody's poor. Nobody's got nothing. I'm pretty sure by saying nobody's got nothing, I said everybody's got something. And we say that stuff like it's nothing. Words are cheap, man. You just throw them out like pennies. Man, when you're 43, you see a penny on the ground. You think about it. Now, when I was younger, I would always pick them up. But now I think, man, is it worth it to go all the way down there for that? I don't know if it is or not. And our words we treat as even cheaper than than a penny we wouldn't even pick up. A dirty penny with something sticky on it. Yeah, right? I painted that picture. I'm sure Asher has come to you with some of that before. Look what I found. But words should not be treated as something cheap. Jesus did not treat words as something cheap. Jesus treated words as something valuable, something precious, fitly framed, like golden apples in frames of silver. That's the way Jesus treated words. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to impart a little bit of scripture to you today because the Lord's been just stirring my heart that he's working in us and we are getting in the way because God's got these really huge things he wants for us. These, I mean massive things. You understand that God is not on a budget and the blessings that he has for you, he doesn't have to work those in to his annual plan. Right? He, do, he doesn't have to do that. That's not what God has to do. We treat him like he's like us. And like when there's unexpected expenses, we have to figure out where that's going to come from. But God's not like that. And so when we have need in our lives, whatever that might be, we're like, well, I don't know how that's going to happen. Because this is a health condition that has no cure. Or this is a person on my job that I'm not allowed to fire. They're going to be there. <laughs> There's problems, right? There's a lot of problems. But God has, he is the solution to all the problems. Judy, you are so right. He does not take us to it without the grace to sustain us through it. I know God's not going to heal every one of your loved ones. He is not going to heal every one of your loved ones. Does that mean God's grace is not sufficient? That is not what that means. 
His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient when I'm listening to my father throw up so hard that I think he cannot possibly be standing upright anymore. It tears your heart out. When you see your loved ones go through things, it tears your heart out because it's awful. And that's what life is. Life is awful. Life is knowing that when they want the keys, not only can they not have the keys, but they may never get the keys again, Diane. Like, that's what life is. But God is bigger than all of that. He's bigger than all of that. And my words need to better acknowledge his power and his might. My devotion has been in the book of Job and it's tearing me up. It's not the first time I've read Job. I've read Job many times. But y'all know how the word of God is. You get in it. You see something totally different you've never seen before. You're convinced that was not there the last time. I have no idea where this has been. But as Sister Juanita is so good at pointing out, she's like, you see it when you need it. That's why you see something different this time is because you needed it this time. And so I'm looking at Job, and Job was this great dude. Everybody liked him. He was well thought of, great family, beautiful estate. Very successful. And some, you know, little meeting in the air happens. And uh, the angels are coming before the Lord. The devil shows himself with them. And, you know, God says, have you considered my servant Job? Man. I hope Job never finds out about that conversation. And, the, and, and the, the devil's like, well, of course, Job is a great servant to you. He's got everything. He's got everything he needs. He's got a great family. He's got a great job. He's, he's a leader in his community. Of course. You take all that away from him, he won't bless you. He'll curse you. God says, all right. Maybe there's some of you who feel like God just had a conversation with Satan and said, all right. All right. All those things that you think make him love me. Take those away, but don't touch him. It took, he took away all the material goods. He took away the entire family that Job had. He took away everything. And Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Do you understand that I don't think there's one of us that could even get to that place? Even without the Lord touching our health, I think if we lost our house and our car and our children, we would just be, that would be it. I'm being real. We've been blessed, and it's hard to live without blessings when you have been blessed. And I don't think there's anything worse than losing your child. I cannot think of anything worse. When you marry a spouse, you go into it understanding one of us is going to be leaving the other one behind. You understand that. One of us is going to go first, statistically. And it's probably going to be you. <laughs> That's what the ladies always think. They're like, and it's probably going to be you. Right? Because we know how y'all eat. We're like, we want a chicken salad. And y'all are like, but let's fry that chicken, baby. You and you're laughing because it's true. You want that grilled chicken salad, and he wants it fried. And you're like, cholesterol is a problem. And he's like, let's leave that in the hands of the Lord. 
Let's just trust God with our arteries. So to lose a child is like awful because it's not something, it's unnatural, it's out of order, all of those things. Job did that and still he was able to bless the Lord. And this kind of shows you where his mindset was because when Satan comes back before the Lord and the Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? Satan's like, yes. The only reason he loves you is because his health is so good. Come on, man. But you know there's some truth in that because you can get through a lot of stuff when it's outside. Man, it's that inside stuff. That makes it hard. Made it so hard that Job's wife said, I'm done. And I'm out of here. I don't understand why you don't just curse God and die. Because your situation has been more than I can stand. Her health wasn't touched. But those of you who have dealt with caregiving someone who is walking through something that dire, you understand that you get real quick to that place where you're like, Lord, like... I would rather have it than them have it. Amen. It literally would be easier for me to deal with if I just had the cancer instead of them. Or if I had the heart issues instead of them. Or if I had the whatever it is. We've all been there at some point in our lives where we were like, man, and Job's wife was out. She was like, this is more than I signed up for. And then Job is sitting for days and days and days and days. And the wittiest repartee ensued. Now the Bible kind of indicates that at least three of these guys were his friends. But I'll be real honest with you. I do have some friends that will speak to me in that way. But I feel like my friends have a little more compassion than Job's friends had. Because they spent 30 chapters telling him, you did this. It's your fault, you did this. And we can argue whether or not we all deserve to be in the state that Job's in. Because the truth is, we are sinners, we are born in sin, and we do all deserve that. That's what we do deserve. We deserve death, but not a quick one, a long, slow, debilitating one, because we are sinners. But that had nothing to do with Job's condition. The thing about Job was, though, that he was like, no, nah, I'm pretty sure I ain't done anything wrong. I want to know what's, what in the world's going on with God. Like, why don't you just kill me? Again, if you've ever had a long-term terminal illness, that is exactly the thoughts that you have. God, I don't know why you're so upset, but why don't you just kill me and get it over with? Because this is more than I can stand. There's no doubt in my mind that there are people in this very room that have had those thoughts. Somewhere between chapter 2 and chapter 40, you lose sight of why Job was walking through what he was walking through. I don't know exactly where we lose sight of it. But, but you start losing sight of the way the whole thing started in the first place, which is all of us are created to bring God glory. So one of the premises that you need to understand is 
Satan never gets to allow anything in your life that God didn't say it was okay for. Listen to what I'm saying to you. God is the only one that allows things in your life. Satan may be the originator, but God is the one that says it was okay because he was going to use it for his glory. Satan does not get to do things without God's permission. Understand this. There's not a, a, a tiny molecule in the universe that gets to do something without God saying it's okay. There's nothing that gets by him. He's not too busy. He knows every hair on your head. And what color they are. I mean, for real, for real. But sometimes my words seem to think, God has lost control and Satan is wreaking havoc in my life. I'm sitting here with my friends and they're talking about how I've messed up and brought this on myself. You know, you come through all of that conversation and all of that conversation was about relationship. Because you think that the story of your life are a series of events. Your life story isn't about the events. It's about the way you respond to the events. That's what the story is. The story isn't, I grew up so-and-so. I went to school. I did this for a living. I married this person. We had these kids. I got sick with this. And then I died. That's not your story. And that's why you don't see movies like that. Not interesting. The story is, I was born here. And this is the way I responded to the people raising me and my environment. Maybe it was a good life, maybe it was a bad life, but this was my response to it. Do you understand? That's what God's working in me. It's not about what happens, it's about my response to what happens. Paul, when he was writing to the church, he said, you need to not let corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Now, everybody wants to talk about that's cussing, Okay? But if you look at the context of it, that's not what Paul was talking about. Dad Jimmett. <laughs> and you might be thinking, what the Sam Hill was he talking about? <laughs> he was talking to, right. He was talking about things that tear down. Things that tear down. You know why? Because he goes on to talk about we need to use words that build up. Instead of tearing down, we want to build up. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. I know that this is a live broadcast that goes out into the world and that there's the possibility my coworkers are watching. So I will use no names so that I can protect the innocent and the slightly guilty. <laughs> but you know, if you work on a workplace and it's more than just you, maybe even if it is just you, there's conflict. Most of it is under the surface. You know, some people just don't get along with each other. Some people are annoying, so you understand why, you know. Right? I mean, come on. Latanya, I appreciate your honesty and the Holy Spirit just moving in. She's just like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
getting the Holy Ghost back on the third row <laughs> over her co-workers. I am with you. But the Lord spoke to me this week and was like, you know, it's not about the co-workers that do things that are annoying. It's not about the co-workers that don't even work. And you think, why are they getting paid for this? I could do bad all by myself. It is about building up instead of tearing down. And we find it so easy to destroy rather than to create. Now, in the Word of God, the Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 18, he's in the middle of talking to his disciples about a whole bunch of stuff. And right here in the midst of it, he says, so what I'm saying to you is whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I thought about that and thought, how many times have my words bound the good things and loosed the bad things? Because I wasn't listening to what the Spirit of the Lord was doing. So I, I'm not yet to the proper response yet. I'm not saying I'm able to circumvent God's will and create terrible things on the earth. What I'm saying is I am chasing after the wrong things and God is allowing me to catch them so that he can build my character and change my responses. Nathan, all things work together for my good. You know why? Because I am called according to his purpose. And that means even when there's something, a rat's nest in my motorcycle that is just massive. I pulled that seat off Friday to change that battery and I knew what it was when I saw it. You see a whole bunch of fluffy stuff that's just all packed in a small space, you better move. There might be something in there. I've seen it in our grill before is why I recognized it. I've seen these fluffy nests, and then I've thought, what is that? And innocent. And then you see something move, Jesus. It is horrible. It's so disgusting. I love God, and I love that he's a creator. Most of his creatures I could do without. Amen. Most, Just most of them. The vast majority. All the bugs, all the spiders, all the flying things. I'm not even... I will jump if I hear a bird. There was a bird taking a bath in the ditch next to me while I was cleaning the truck yesterday, and I almost came unglued. I literally almost lost my mind. And she, the little robin red breast, she was like, Whoa! She's like, calm down there, player. I'm over here taking a bath. I was like, don't touch me, little Robin Redbreast. Don't you touch me. Don't like, I don't like that. And I found this rat's nest, but there was, and I called dad because even though my dad is so sick and he hadn't eaten anything for three days that he didn't throw up, I couldn't deal with that. To be fair, I didn't realize that he was that sick. And my mom will be the first to tell you that my dad does not ever tell me and leave I know. He should. <laughs> the only reason I didn't have a tattoo when I was 12 was because my mother. Because <laughs> daddy would have said yes. That makes sense. I'll go with you. Let's get matching ones. Great. So dad comes down and he pulls that out. Well, when we started pulling it out, there was no living creatures in it. Praise the Lord. Thank God. God is gracious. He knew he, he didn't put on us more than we could bear. Right? Now, my thought would be, why not just never put a rat's nest in my motorcycle? Like, how about that, Lord? You know the sparrow that falls. Maybe have mama rat live somewhere else with her little baby children. And they can be part of somebody else's motorcycle. 
That's not what God had. God put them in my bike seat. And then a snake apparently found them because there was a shed snake skin in pieces. Also, under I'm, I'm telling you the story about an unfortunate occurrence. And there's a whole lot of things in your life that are negative that take place, and you can look at those things and you can think, These don't, this doesn't make sense. Why did this happen? Why is this a part of my life? Why does it smell like a barnyard under my motorcycle seat now? You know that petting zoo smell? You know what I'm talking about? They got the goats and the sheep. And there's this smell that animals have when they're all kind of hanging out and eating and going to the restroom in the same area. I don't want y'all to get hungry. That's why I'm telling you this. Y'all are grossed out now, and it's not a problem. I wonder how much it is that God wants to do that I am not letting him do because I'm looking at the events instead of looking at my response to the events. That coronation service yesterday, I didn't watch it at 5 o'clock in the morning. But I watched some of the clips from it yesterday evening. And I thought, wow, this is a really long service, first of all, is what I thought. I thought this is taking forever. Like, crown him. But I, everything was choreographed just so. They had cue cards so that they said the right things. Everything was laid out so that things were done correctly. And I thought, wow, that took so much planning and so much, like they had to really get it done. Like most of the people that were at the last coronation are dead. It was 60 years ago. You know what I'm saying? That it was, it's not like, oh, well, this is how we did it last time. No, they had to like get it together. The occurrences in your life may be the first time that you've encountered these particular occurrences. Maybe the events that you're walking through, you've never walked through those things before. And what God is wanting to do in us is he's wanting to bring about the trust and the faith that gives the right response. Is it going to stop bad things from happening? No, you are always going to learn more from bad things happening than from good things happening. That's a fact. That's a fact. Bad things will happen. Your son will be mowing the yard, and then you'll get a phone call that he's run over his toe. And it will flip you out. And you will call your church family and say, you've got to pray. I don't want my son to lose his big toe. And your church family will pray. And he won't lose his big toe. And there's some of us that might say, why did that stupidity have to happen in the first place? Why not just never go through it? But look where your faith is now from where it was before. And then when things don't look right and you've got to take him back to the doctor and you send out a prayer request, pray that there's no infection. It's been three weeks. Pray that there's no infection or they'll have to amputate it. And the church family prays. And the doctor goes in and pulls out grass and dirt. This is why I don't go to the emergency room, you know what I'm saying? They just trying to get you stitched up so that you don't die on their property. They're like, glue that together, get that child out of here. There's all kind of mess in there. But guess what? There wasn't. There wasn't no infection. Right, Mother Wilson? There's no infection. The doctor didn't even believe it. We packed all kinds of mess in here and still no infection. That's right. Only God can do that. Guess where Tessa's faith is now? 
She's like right at that point where she's pulling the car over and praying for sick people on the side of the road. She's like, you wouldn't believe what God can do. And even more than that, what it's doing in the lives of her children. Because half of them have part-time jobs in the healthcare field. They understand what infection means. They understand what a miracle is. Y'all, if we can learn to speak life. Amen. Does that mean every time that you're going to get to keep your toe? No. But God's going to be glorified either way. And that's the thing. When we can get there and say, okay, God, I don't like the doctor's report. I don't like it at all. But I know that you knew what it was going to be before we got here. So now, Lord, what are you going to do? Because whatever it is, I need you to help me walk through it. I need you to help my loved one walk through it. That's harder, really, trusting God with your loved one. If it was Tessa's toe, she could believe God a lot more easily, whatever the circumstances, than if it's her child's toe. And it's easier for you to pray for my need than it is for you to pray for your own need. We will speak life into other people's lives before we will speak life into our own life. And I don't know why that is, unless it's just we don't think we deserve it. We're pretty sure God loves everybody else more. I have no idea why it is. Maybe we just have a deep understanding that our character is flawed and there's a lot of work that needs done. So we're like, well, it makes sense. Yep, it's going to be a dark valley. I got a lot to learn. It makes sense. Don't speak that. Speak life. You know what God made Job do? Job did. Bridget just said it. Made him pray for his friends. He showed him to his self to be mighty and awesome and amazing. He was like, Joe, I've got the cattle on a thousand hills. I've got everything. I've got everything. But you need to pray for the people that you've been having a problem with. Because I'm using friends in quotation marks. Sometimes the people that you thought were friends, you go through a hard time and you're like, you know what? We aren't friends. We'll never be friends. And I hate you a little bit right now. You know, it'll bring out those hard times will bring that out in you. And so then it's like, well, what if you're supposed to speak life into that person instead of death? Well, that person is supposed to be a Christian and they're supposed to be, uh, uh-uh. You can't do anything about anybody but yourself. That's it. That's the only person you have any control over. And yours over yourself is marginal. So what are you speaking into that person's life? You're like, but you don't know what they did. No, I don't. I don't know what they did. But I know what God did. And God said, Job, although you have poor taste in friends, He didn't say that part. He said, you need to pray for your friends because I'm not going to forgive them until you do it. And so then you have that character that is being tested. Just like when God, y'all remember when God showed himself to Moses, he was so upset with the children of Israel because they were stupid like we are. And God was like, step aside, Moses. I'm fixing to kill them all. I'm going to start over with you. And Moses fell flat on his face and said, God, don't do it. It is not that God changed his mind. Do you understand that? That's not what was happening. God already knew what he was going to do. He was testing Moses. Just like he was testing Job. Put your pride aside. Stop speaking death into the people around you. Stop speaking death into your own life. 
and say, Lord, you said where two or three were gathered in your name that you would be in the midst. Me and my prayer partners are speaking life into these situations. We're speaking life. If you got problems at work, you got coworkers that are being some kind of way, when you take aside another coworker, don't gossip about that coworker and how useless they are, and I'm sorry they're useless, but you take that coworker and say, listen, let's pray for this friend, this coworker, that God can do a mighty work in them. They'll be like, I don't think he can. I know her. Let's believe God. Let's agree. Let's speak life. Watch things change and see what God does. Y'all, when Kenzie first came down with this, whatever virus it was, that attacked her heart, like it did not look good. And she's young. She's in her 20s. She's a baby. And her mom was just posting prayer requests like, hey, be praying this happened. Be praying they're saying this. They're doing tests on this. This has been a, a process over the last several weeks. Hey, her heart won't start back. And there's part of you that just says, well, then that's it then. And it could have been very easily. But God doesn't make any sense, and he does what he's going to do. And now for the rest of Kinsey's life, she's going to live a miraculous life because she should be dead, and she is not. But God is deserving of all praise and all glory whether we live or we die. He's worthy of all glory and all praise if we have a good day at work or we don't. He's worthy of all praise when we feel good and sometimes when we just have to tell ourselves, it's all in my mind, I got Jesus' knees. Whatever's going on, Lord, I'm, you know, Lord, I feel this way. But you are worthy anyway. There's something about telling God how worthy he is and how big he is and how awesome he is that will just about convince you that you can trust him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your sweet presence. We thank you for the way that you have just moved in our hearts in this place. We need you to make us aware of these little bad habits that we cling to because it's hard to do the right thing. It's easier to talk about our coworkers in a negative way, in a corrupt way, rather than in a life-giving, edifying way. It is easier for us to discuss our loved one's health in a negative way than in a a life-giving way, like, wow, thank you, Lord, for giving my loved one a wake-up call so that they will make sure they are right with you. If there's anyone who needs prayer, these altars are open. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know that there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name
hearts want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive there's oppression I speak Jesus I just want to Speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. Now I speak Jesus. the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. I speak Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Jesus. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may his, his face shine upon you in mighty and awesome ways. Thank you, Lord, for being in this place. Lead us and guide us, Lord Jesus, into all truth and righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Join us on Wednesday night if you want to get into the Word. We're digging into the Word on Wednesdays. Also, we're going to be at Bella Vista next Saturday at 3 o'clock. We're going to be blessing them in song. And then on Sunday is Mother's Day, and we're going to be celebrating our mothers because you ladies are awesome. It's a fact. And we love to celebrate that. So speak life this week, y'all, in Jesus' name.